Alrighty, thanks, Richard. Well, uh, I'll be talking about um, Lower Poudre Creek today, and uh, things have changed dramatically on Poudre Creek over the last, particularly last uh, 50 years or so, with the building of Monticello Dam uh, dramatically changing the hydrology of the system. Prior to um, the completion of the dam in 1957, Poudre Creek used to get flows of about 50,000 CFS every five years. Um, the highest flow since the construction of the dam was less than half that. And in a typical year, we're probably getting about a tenth of the uh, flows on the lower part of the creek than occurred historically. So historically, there was a lot more uh, scouring flow events. And, um, and then the creek would go dry in the summertime. And um, since 2000, as a result of a settlement agreement over flows, Puda Creek has become a perpetually flowing stream and that has changed the uh, hydrology as well. So we have less water overall, but it's available uh, all the time, at least uh, next to the low flow channel. So the challenge is largely, um, what do we make of this system that's so highly disturbed? Um, how can we reconcile um, the vegetation to the current flow regime? And how can we overcome some of the um, changes that have been uh, done to the channel in the past that interrupted the uh, natural processes that would have naturally sustained riparian vegetation. So um, the biggest change, of course, is the hydrology. Um, less water overall, dramatically less water, uh, but perpetual flows. And then uh, the creek has historically been degraded by gravel mining, um, channelization, straightening uh, in an effort to move the flood flows out as quickly as possible. Uh, to reduce the flooding in the cities of Davis and Winters, and um, vegetation removal for uh, flood protection. And all of these um, changes have resulted in uh, invasion by um, 20 primary invasive weeds um, with um, eucalyptus, arundo, Himalayan blackberry, and tamarisk being the most uh, uh, severe. And so our challenge now is that um, is to restore a more natural um, composition, to restore um, a uh, scaled down riparian corridor that's matched to current flows, uh, to increase the diversity of native vegetation and uh, wildlife habitats. Uh, we, we do have a, a, an active wildlife monitoring program, Fish and Wildlife Monitoring, and um, uh, our our monitoring is done by UC Davis. Um, we're finding that we do have tremendous wildlife uh, value, even in spite of all these uh, historic um, degradations and all the changes. We have over 200 species of birds that use Poudre Creek at least uh, uh, some of the time, and we have uh, many um, obligate nesting, obligate riparian nesting species on Poudre Creek. Um, so I should uh, mention right up front, I'm not a forester. Uh, but I play one on Poudre Creek. Um, so uh, we are trying to apply forestry practices to uh, riparian forests. So um, here's uh, a map of Poudre Creek. We are um, basically the boundary between Yolo County and Solano County, Yolo County to the north. And then we have um, our, our creek flows out of Lake Berryessa on the um, left side of, of this map and flows to the Yolo Bypass and uh, joins the Yolo Bypass and connects to the Sacramento River through a series of canals and sloughs um, connecting up at Rio Vista. So that's how the salmon migrate up into Poudre Creek. Uh, we've had some pretty, uh, pretty good salmon runs for our size. Uh, we had, um, I think our, our peak was 35 red, so we're certainly not going to compete with a place like the American River, but it's pretty exciting to see salmon in our creek. And uh, we had uh, uh, about uh, 10 reds this year, which was amazing because we had virtually no runoff. So these were just controlled releases that allowed salmon to move up into Lower Pitta Creek. So um, Richard introduced the concept of uh, passive restoration, and that um, is defined as restoration through natural processes. And this would be typically following fire or weed control or uh, trash removal. Um, Kevin uh, 
noted how important fire can be to aspen restoration. Um, we have um, uh, a different populist species. We have western cottonwood on Puda Creek, which is a very important species for Puda Creek, um, but it is very fire intolerant. And in fact, um, the wildfires that we've experienced on Puda Creek have tended to reduce the number of cottonwoods. What we really need are high flows to give us uh, good cottonwood seedling recruitment. Um, and it's difficult to get seedling recruitment of cottonwoods in the absence of uh, high flows. Uh, but we've done quite a bit of work with um, uh, restoration of sites after fires, uh, uh, primarily by eliminating the, the regeneration of weeds and selecting for native vegetation. Uh, we've also done quite a bit of weed control. Some of our sites have very high percentage of invasive weeds, particularly um, Himalayan blackberry can just smother uh, riparian landscapes. And then uh, we've removed a lot of trash from the riparian corridor and enabled native vegetation to recover um, by uh, clearing old dump sites. So I'd like to um, use the Vickery fire as an example of, of a very successful restoration occurring after a fire. The Vickery property is um, a little bit east of the city of Winters and um, maybe a couple miles downstream or downstream of 505 uh, is another landmark. And um, the Vickery fire um, burned up a lot of Himalayan blackberry that had made the creek inaccessible. In fact, um, John Vickery, the owner, hadn't seen the creek in 20 or 30 years before this fire because it was so overgrown, particularly with uh, blackberry thicket. But he also had some tamarisk and uh, quite a bit of eucalyptus trees. Uh, this is what the site looked like immediately after the fire. This was uh, in, the fire occurred in 2002. And um, after the fire, there was a lot of debris of um, trees that were dozed up to control the fire. And um, so the first challenge was to actually stack and burn some of the uh, debris that the fire had left behind. And then uh, soon after the fire, we had tremendous resprouting of um, Himalayan blackberry. And uh, John Vickery was very good about uh, spraying out these um, emerging uh, blackberry sprouts and, and essentially selecting for the native species. Um, in the, about the middle of the slide here, we see um, a dry residue of blackberry thicket. And that, was, um, that thicket was probably five to six feet um, and completely covering most of the floodplain uh, prior to the fire. So the fire really opened things up and enabled us to get in there and do some um, invasive weed control. And then there was a lot of trash that was uh, uh, really old uh, trash that had been dumped in the creek and covered over by blackberry thicket. And so um, this was an opportunity to uh, remove trash as well. And this is um, um, by about uh, 2007, we had tremendous regeneration of oaks. Uh, these were just natural oak seedlings coming up. Some of them were resprouts after the fire. Um, the elevation of this site was suitable for passive restoration. In other words, uh, the, um, the floodplain was at a fairly low elevation. And so these areas would flood up uh, fairly frequently uh, with our reduced flow regime. Um, you can't see it very well in this picture, but the, this is looking toward the creek, with the creek being uh, about the uh, middle of the uh, slide. Um, but uh, anyway, I would have been happy to get this kind of oak uh, generation in one of our planted sites. You can see the oaks are fairly close together, and they tend to come up in thickets. And I think that gives them some advantage over uh, competing vegetation, but mostly uh, this is just the result of keeping the weeds from coming back and uh, smothering the oaks before they could get going. And this site is well established, and uh, those oaks are, uh, are perennialized, obviously, and uh, put on uh, remarkable growth for just seven years, or not even, maybe five years since the fire. So we also have done quite a bit of eucalyptus removal. Um, I like this shot because it shows the amount of wood chips left behind from grinding or chipping the um, eucalyptus. And 
the inset photo on the left shows um, that we had some really big eucalyptus trees, uh, some of them up to uh, three, four feet in uh, diameter at the base. Um, the, um, the main photo in this slide shows um, the really wonderful uh, valley oak woodland that we had um, that was just um, being invaded by the eucalyptus. And the eucalyptus were really suppressing a lot of the um, oak seedlings. So we had pretty good stand of oaks there left behind from just removing the eucalyptus. And all around the eucalyptus stumps, um, the oak seedlings were coming up very, uh, very thick. And the only thing that we've done to this site is remove invasive weeds. And it's coming back very nicely with native vegetation. And here's a shot of some wild rose regeneration uh, around a um, eucalyptus stump in the center of the photo uh, in the middle of that red circle. Um, that stump has actually got a few eucalyptus sprouts, so we did have to come back and retreat to keep the eucalyptus from coming back again. But um, the, the rose seedlings came up very densely around the eucalyptus removal. and. Um, that was uh, a great example of passive restoration because we didn't have to plant those roses. They just came in on their own as they got more sunlight and less competition from the eucalyptus. Eucalyptus, if you're not familiar with it, this is the river red gum. It's the most common eucalyptus in uh, Australia along uh, rivers in Australia. And apparently, it likes the conditions on Poudre Creek. I understand it's not, uh, you know, other waterways that have eucalyptus maybe don't have them invading the way that we do, but um, uh, these eucalyptus uh, are right at home on Poudre Creek, and they tend to form uh, monoculture stands of eucalyptus if they're, uh, if, if they're not controlled. Um, the earliest eucalyptus were actually on Poudre Creek, uh, at least by 1911. Um, uh, Jack London, uh, the author and, uh, 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 and merchant, uh, 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 shipper uh, brought a lot of eucalyptus and, and over from Australia and really promoted them uh, in California. In fact, there was a lot of trade with Australia uh, in the uh, 1800s, uh, about the gold rush time, and it was actually faster to bring goods from Australia than it was from the eastern United States before the Transcontinental Railroad. So um, that's how the eucalyptus got here, and, and we have a postcard from 1911 of eucalyptus um, on, uh, on Poudre Creek at winter. So we know that eucalyptus have been on the creek for a long time. Uh, here's another site. Uh, this involved uh, really some active restoration, re-sloping a very steep bank. But this bank had 60 eucalyptus trees averaging uh, about two feet in diameter. And we cut down the eucalyptus trees. There's an inset picture of the pile of slash that was generated in some of the stumps of the um, eucalyptus, and we used the logs on site as part of a revetment to help hold the slope. Uh, that also reduced the cost of removing the eucalyptus by about half by reusing the larger logs since we didn't have to haul them away. And what we're seeing here is that there were some oak trees that have been really struggling uh, to grow in competition with these tall eucalyptus trees. Um, but just removing the eucalyptus has um, released these oaks and uh, allow them to start to flourish. This was immediately after uh, removal of the eucalyptus, but I think those oaks are probably doing uh, quite well now and, and likely to uh, drop acorns and, and repopulate this slope with uh, oak seedlings. And then uh, active restoration is needed in places where um, there has been um, as such a disturbance that passive restoration alone uh, wouldn't succeed in, in bringing vegetation back. This is typically sites that require some geomorphic restoration, uh, things like bank stabilization or even uh, channel realignment or constructing floodplains where they've been graded away. Um, typically, we're interested in narrowing the uh, flow channel to reconcile the channel with current flows and then um, introducing a greater diversity of native vegetation than what was there previously, and achieving a relationship of the floodplain elevation with the, with the flow channel such that um, 
it's low enough to support natural recruitment of native vegetation. So typically on Puda Creek, this means that the floodplain should be about two feet above the low flow water surface elevation so that they flood up in uh, a typical winter runoff event. And get, this gives us a chance to, to establish some um, cottonwoods from uh, seed drop and other native uh, species. Um, our starting condition is often without floodplains at all, but just high terraces adjacent to the creek, maybe um, 8 to 10 feet even above uh, water surface elevation with a very steep drop into the channel. And then typically, they're covered with Himalayan blackberries. So there's very little chance for native vegetation to establish naturally under those conditions. And so it really requires us to do some pretty intensive grading of those terraces. And while we're at it, um, narrowing up the uh, channel to um, uh, allow faster flows and better aquatic habitat. Um, this has been the focus of most of our recent uh, restoration work, and I'll go into some examples in a moment. So uh, this happens to be a tributary of Puda Creek. This is Pleasance Creek, the Hoskins Ranch, one of the um, original settlements on Pleasance Creek. Um, Pleasance Creek comes in to Puda Creek at Lake Solano, so it's about seven miles below um, Monticello Dam. And um, in this picture, you can see circled are some uh, uh, pickets for a uh, barbed wire fence that um, the fence is draped into the creek. So that, that fence was newly installed along the edge of the creek, and the bank eroded out from under it and left this uh, vertical bank. And this bank's become vertical as the creek flows up against um, the bank on the outside of a meander. So the flow in this case is going from uh, right to left and um, undercutting this bank, and it's collapsing due to gravity. And this is a typical restoration of a vertical bank site. This is uh, in that same vicinity. Um, this, the flow is coming from the top of the photo and around down toward the uh, bottom and off to the right. And uh, we installed, we, well, we constructed these uh, floodplains and laid back the bank. This channel goes dry in the summertime, so all this work could be done in a dry channel. And then we installed some rock vein flow deflectors about every 70 feet um, along the um, radius of this um, meander bend. And um, the rock veins helped to stabilize the newly constructed floodplain until vegetation could grow back in. So this was. A uh, photo was taken a year after construction, um, and now we have actually uh, a lot of trees and brush growing on that uh, outside meander floodplain. And um, this uh, site came through a high flow event in 2006 um, unscathed, uh, so it was very stable in, in high flows. Uh, and so uh, in this case, um, Restoration was only possible after um, constructing the floodplain that was absent and, and allowing the channel to have some natural dissipation of energy over the floodplain. Um, this channel had incised about 20 feet since Monticello Dam, so about 20 feet in 50 years in response to the changing hydrology of the main channel of Puda Creek. Um, and this channel had head cut upstream for about seven miles from the main channel of Puda Creek. And so um, the, the original change here was a hydrologic change that led to the uh, incision of the channel and the concentration of the energy of the water within the channel that used to flood up over the surrounding landscape. Uh, and this treatment is very successful, and it's one that we're looking to replicate along uh, the seven miles of Lower Pleasance Creek and other uh, tributaries to Puda Creek as well. Uh, the next slide I'd like to talk about is Winters Puda Creek Park. This is uh, in downtown Winters, and there's two photos here, one taken before channel narrowing and the other in the lower right taken after we narrowed the channel. So as you can see in the upper left, um, the channel was essentially a captured gravel pit that was um, 60 to 90 feet wide typically and uniformly about 6 feet deep. Uh, without meander form or pool riffle sequence. This was essentially one continuous pool. Um, we were able to restore the, uh, a narrower channel, more meandering form. Um, we were able to also um, uh, 
create floodplains, as you can see in the lower right-hand uh, photo, there are some uh, floodplains um, that uh, are absent in the photo um, on the upper left. And this is a typical cross-section of the work at Winters Pudder Creek Park. We had essentially um, a very deep um, and wide channel represented by the dark black line. And the design channel was um, represented by the dashed line showing um, a rather canal-like looking initial uh, channel form, which was um, uh, constructed that way to allow um, contractors to um, basically build a, a fairly simple uh, constructed channel that um, we would then let nature take over and sculpt into a more natural looking channel. But the starting condition, as we see on the right hand side of this cross section, was a very high terrace with actually an inverted slope of the floodplain so that the um, instead of the floodplain sloping toward the channel, it was actually sloping away from the channel. Um, very difficult to get any native vegetation to grow in a condition like this. And you can see that the elevation of this terrace was uh, about 10 feet above the uh, design elevation of our floodplain. And then we used that material to fill in the over wide and deep channel to create a, a smaller channel with floodplains um, on uh, both banks. And so here's a, in the upper left is what the channel looked like uh, prior to uh, construction. It was a very wide, um, deep pool. Um, essentially a captured gravel pit with very high terraces and um, a little bit hard to see in this upper left photo, but there's that patch of green right in the middle of the photo on the, uh, on the left bank is uh, Arundo, and um, the rest of that floodplain was pretty much covered in Himalayan blackberry, and it was impenetrable when I first saw it in 2000. Um, so the first step was to remove the invasive vegetation so we could grade the floodplain and then create a, a narrower channel. On the lower right is uh, the diversion pipes that we laid down the uh, meander path of the design channel. And um, we were then able to divert the flow into these pipes and fill in uh, the channel around those pipes after the channel was dewatered. So here's one of our contractors walking along this uh, partially submerged pipe. The diversion pipes have neutral buoyancy, and so when they're filled with water, they tend to um, float uh, right at the water surface, allowing our contractors uh, to appear to be walking on water. Um, they, they were good, but they weren't quite that good. But as you can see in this photo, there was no floodplain at all on the right-hand side. There was just a very steep bank diving straight into this uh, captured gravel pit. And here's what the channel looked like when um, the flow was diverted into these uh, twin 24-inch pipes. And um, the channel in this shot is dewatered. You can see the water line on the left-hand side of the photo about halfway up the slide. Um, and this uh, channel through here was probably six to eight feet deep. Um, and um, once the channel was dewatered, then we could begin filling operations. Um, this is what the filling operations look like. Um, we staged uh, a fair amount of fill material on site, and we also graded some of the adjacent terraces to generate the fill necessary to achieve floodplain elevation. On the um, lower right, the, on the right-hand side of the photo, you can just barely see the uh, twin pipes in there. That's where the, uh, uh, the, the channel was, uh, the new channel was being routed. And here's what the uh, site looked like as we were approaching final grade. Um, we um, filled in the channel around our diversion pipes and then resloped the, um, the new channel and um, subsequently lined it with gravel and constructed some riffles every uh, 200 feet along this reach. There were only three riffles in a mile of creek when we started, and we ended up with 14 riffles um, con uh, constructing constructing 14 additional riffles uh, uh, in this reach so we could have a, a pool riffle sequence in addition to the meander form. 
and then um, when the floodplain floodplain elevations were restored and the meander pattern was restored, then we cut open the pipes and allowed the water to be released back into the design channel. Um, we actually flooded up the channel first with some controlled releases before and, and allowed the um, silt to settle uh, before we actually released flow into the channel. And this is what the restored channel looked like. This is uh, looking upstream underneath the uh, Winters uh, Railroad Bridge. Um, in the middle of the project, we realized that the center pier of the railroad bridge and the car bridge had actually been undermined by the, the channel, and they were actually um, uh, standing on piers that were submerged in the channel. So um, that gives you a sense of the starting dimensions were about three times the uh, design dimensions uh, of the channel. Um, also, you can see a few of the remnant trees that are kind of leaning out toward the flow channel. That's where the original water line was along the, the line of those mature trees. For example, from the bridge pier to the uh, tree in the middle right, um, that was the original um, channel width. And then the uh, channel rose very steeply behind that, uh, creating very little opportunity for natural recruitment of native vegetation. The finished channel is about two feet above uh, water surface elevation with a 1% slope toward the banks, which is um, an ideal elevation for natural recruitment of native riparian vegetation. So simply by restoring natural channel geometry, we're creating the conditions for natural recruitment of native vegetation. This project was finished in 2011. Unfortunately, we haven't had normal rainfall events uh, since then. It's been pretty dry. so. Uh, we have seen some cottonwood recruitment, but it's been right on the edge of the flow channel, not across the floodplain as we would expect. So we think uh, as soon as we do get natural flows again, that we'll, we'll see a lot more um, natural cottonwood regeneration. So after doing this much grading, we had to do a lot of uh, revegetation and uh, watering in of the, uh, of, the, of the trees and shrubs that we planted. We planted about 5,000 trees and shrubs on a one-mile reach of Poudre Creek. Uh, one of the things that really determines the success of restoration projects is proper soil fertility, particularly in sites that have to be graded uh, to, to back to natural form. And this is an example of a soil test um, that we took at one of our recent restoration sites. And uh, this time I had an agronomist recommend um, a fertilizer mixture for us, custom made to the requirements of this particular site. And it turned out to be much higher in potassium than I would have uh, than I would have expected, and uh, it's kind of interesting because potassium is um, is concentrated in wood ash, and we've we've observed uh, a lot of vigorous growth after fires, and I think part of that is um, is the natural fertilization you get from wood ash, and particularly in our soils where we have very high magnesium. Uh, the plants can have a hard time getting enough potassium. So we're simply adding back the nutrients to create a balanced um, starting fertility of the soil. And then um, as the, the plants grow and naturally begin to recycle those nutrients, then we would expect to, um, uh, to see this fertility maintained. So even though we're only fertilizing once after the grading and putting our plants in, um, we're, we're restoring enough fertility to kind of jumpstart the natural nutrient uh, cycling. And then um, the other uh, thing that we've done is, is taken leaf tests, monthly leaf tests in our restoration sites, um, and particularly concentrated on fertility of uh, micronutrients, which can be supplied by foliar sprays. In this chart, we're looking at um, a treated and untreated leaf sample um, from our Creekside Way uh, restoration site in winters. And you can see that you know the copper levels and the zinc levels are much higher in the treated than the untreated. And the, the number on the very right-hand side is uh, molybdenum, which um, is a very significant nutrient for stimulating rapid growth of young seedlings. And so we have nine parts per million, for example, in the treated and uh, about a half a part per million in the untreated. Um, the key to uh, understanding 
micronutrient fertility is to take a time series of leaf tests. So ideally, we take our leaf sa samples every month and then we fertilize in between with a custom mixture of nutrients according to what the leaf test is telling us. And by that method, we're able to deduce the amount of uh, nutrient demand of these young seedlings by adding nutrients whenever they're declining from one test to the next or backing off on fertilizing if the nutrients are accumulating from one test to the next. And uh, this uh, uh, concentration on testing and applying just what the plants need has resulted in some remarkably rapid growth. Um, this is one of our uh, restoration sites. Again, this is the Creekside Way site, the one that uh, uh, we were looking at the nutrient analysis in the previous slide. And this is one year after planting a D40 size pot. So these oaks were in pots that were about 10 inches deep and 2 inches around and they were 12 to 18 inches high when we planted them. And um, by one year after planting, these trees were uh, four to five feet tall, and uh, we had 90% survival on this site. The site happened to be um, previously an apricot orchard on the upper bank of, uh, of the creek in a setback area from housing development. So it's 100 feet wide, about four acre site. and. Um, the apricots had taken the last of the phosphorus out of the ground. There's only two parts per million of phosphorus in our soil test for this site, and not even the weeds were growing very well. So we fertilized the whole site with ammonium phosphate uh, before planting, and, um, and then we took uh, regular leaf samples and applied the micronutrients and got this uh, uh, terrific uh, growth rate. And the city of Winters uh, accidentally mowed up our drip lines in June, so these, these trees got no water after June in the first year after planting, and still uh, we had very high survival and um, terrific growth rates. So it really made me a believer that um, our restoration plantings, the success of them, is largely determined in the first 90 days after planting. And then uh, weed control is probably one of the most important things. Um, Kevin touched on this a little bit um, uh, when he t was talking about weed competition being a factor in uh, alder establishment from seedlings. Um, the, uh, this is a, a recipe for pre-emergent herbicide that uh, Scott Johnson recommended uh, with uh, Wilbur Ellis. He calls it the Disneyland mix because it's safe enough to use on the plants in Disneyland. Um, even uh, young trees that are, uh, you know, right after they're put in the ground, you can make this application to the soil surface and suppress broadleaf and, and grassy weeds for the first year and give the plants a chance to establish without weed competition. Um, previously, we had done a little bit of work with spot spraying with Roundup. We still use that uh, in the summertime to catch uh, weeds that have escaped pre-emergent treatment, but if you can prevent the weeds from coming in the first place, you're, you don't have to spray as close to the plants with uh, with Roundup, which is very non-selective, and um, you're preventing that weed competition from happening in the first place. Uh, this will enhance the survival, growth, and establishment, and it also deters rodent damage. Uh, we've had a lot of problems with bowl damage um, to some of our plantings, particularly wild rose, and voles like weedy vegetation right at the base of your plants, and so if you create a clearing, um, a lot of rodents won't cross a clearing because they're likely to become somebody's lunch if they do. So maintaining a weed-free area around our plantings also reduces ro rodent damage. And Scott mentioned that it reduces uh, uh, damage from gophers as well because they're, uh, they're going after um, other plants in, in addition to our, uh, our restoration plantings. So lastly, I want to mention a little bit about our funding sources. Um, most of our funding has come from California water bonds, particularly Propositions 50 and 84. Um, the California Watershed Program run by the Department of Conservation has supported a lot of our early planning work and assessments, and recently some of our uh, restoration work, including some of the work at Winters Pitta Creek Park. Um, the Water Quality Program of the State Water Resource Control Board, formerly part of CalFed, is funding our bank stabilization projects on our upstream tributaries like Pleasance Creek. 
Um, the River Parkway program is funding the bulk of the work at Winters Pudder Creek Park. Wildlife Conservation Board has funded invasive weed control throughout the creek. And the Ecological Restoration Program is currently funding uh, CEQA uh, studies and uh, a feasibility study for a channel realignment on the lower part of the creek and also selected restoration sites upstream. So they're funding some of our current planning efforts. Uh, California Special Funds, the Off-Highway Vehicle Restoration uh, Program has funded some of our work to keep off-highway vehicles, unauthorized vehicles out of the channel. And our uh, farm and ranch cleanup program with uh, Cal EPA has funded a lot of the uh, trash cleanup and removal projects. Uh, recently, we've started to obtain some federal funds from the North American Wetland Conservation Act in partnership with California Waterfowl Association. They've received about $30 million over the last 20 years from this uh, federal funding source. And recently, they've teamed up with us to do some restoration projects on Puda Creek, tying into some of their large-scale restoration projects in the Yellow Bypass. So with that, um, I'll ask, uh, what questions do you have? Well, that was great, uh, Rich. Uh, if we do have a few questions here, I think, um, Mike, you want to bring those into the uh, to the center? Uh, Dave Passavoy is asking, um, why not just girdle eucalyptus and not pay for the removal? Oh. <clears throat> Well, we do we do girdle some of the uh, eucalyptus trees, and uh, that can be quite effective. It can provide some temporary habitat. It's a great strategy, provided um, that they don't turn into widow makers. And um, on some of the more remote sites, um, I think that's more suitable. Um, in downtown winters or places that are going to be visited by the public, um, then um, uh, you know removal is really the uh, the best option. And then if we have to do grading, then we have to take out all the vegetation to be able to do the grading. So that's the other limitation is the sites that need geomorphic restoration uh, girdling um, is going to help the eucalyptus from spreading. But of course, we'd have to take them out before we could do grading. Uh, Peggy's asking uh, whether you uh, considered using the debris uh, really to augment large woody debris in the creek. Well, uh, we do leave uh, brush piles where we can for habitat value, and we are we could use more uh, large woody debris in the creek. Um, we we actually would have to get a 404 permit to place material in the creek, and that's been um, that's a slow process. So, um, but leaving them on the floodplain and allowing them to become large woody debris uh, to get swept into the creek in high flows, um, I think that's an excellent suggestion and. We have done that with some eucalyptus, some somewhat intentionally, somewhat unintentionally. One year, some of our eucalyptus that we had removed and staged for future restoration work uh, picked up and got moved down the creek. But it uh, it certainly didn't uh, cause any problems, and in some cases, did create some large woody debris in the channel. Um, Jack Haynes asking about what chemical was used to remove the blackberry. Well, we use mixtures of glyphosate or Roundup, the aquatic safe formulation, uh, along with a um, uh, methylated seed oil for a penetrant and uh, silicon surfactant for a spreader. And we use uh, typically a 2% uh, Roundup formulation for both Blackberry and Rundo full coverage sprays. Um, blackberry is actually pretty easy to control um, compared to um, Arundo and um, Tamarisk, for example, that seem to require multiple treatments. Glyphosate foliar sprays are also effective on eucalyptus on some of the smaller seedlings and also as a cut stump treatment. Um, glyphosate doesn't work on very many other things very well as a cut stump, but it works great on eucalyptus. Um, I guess Dave is asking who the contractor has been for the geomorphic uh, treatments. I don't know that you want to reveal that. Uh, well, you can, we, if you want. we've used uh, we've used um, a few different contractors uh, streamwise out of um, uh, Mount Shasta has been our uh, designer of a lot of our projects, and he also uh, has constructed some of the smaller projects, particularly the bank stabilization work. 
Um, Majora and Gelati won the bid to do our major creek restoration at Winters Puda Creek Park. And uh, 4M Contracting, Monte Molina, has done a lot of our uh, smaller projects, and in fact, most recently, the NACA project. And uh, uh, we're you know, very pleased with all of those contractors. Um, anything over $30,000 has to go out to bid uh, per the uh, water agency uh, contracting rules. And so um, we, we don't necessarily go with the lowest bidder, but we go with the lowest qualified bidder. And there's usually a qualification round for the larger scale projects.